When they're back in the car, it reeks of London pride, and Polly gets all nervous again. But she doesn't have to say anything, because suddenly Daniel goes, Tell you what, my lovely, why don't you drive us back? And she immediately sees why. There's a police Astra in the car park with them. So Daniel gets out and strides around to the passenger side while Polly fumbles to find the seatbelt releasing thingy. So now Polly feels properly scared. This is a fast, powerful, brand new car, and of course she's going to crash it. She's going to put them both in a ditch or wrap them around a tree. She can picture it very clearly, a stew of crumpled metal, squashed body parts, two different kinds of veneer, and a mashed up elm tree. Even walking to the driver's side feels like the start of casualty. But she doesn't actually ever get in the driver's seat. She's about to when she sees the policeman walking over. They always make me feel guilty, don't they, the police? Whenever the police want to talk to her, she always thinks she's somehow shoplifted a sandwich or accidentally manslaughtered someone. And actually, it doesn't even have to be a policeman. Community support workers, security guards in the shopping centre, traffic wardens, anyone in any kind of uniform, really, they all make her somehow want to confess the stuff. But the policeman isn't interested in talking to Polly. He wants Daniel. So Daniel has to get out again, and it's a bit of a struggle. He's still a tall, powerful man, which is something Polly hadn't really noticed till today. Everyone in the home seems small to her, frail. But here, now, in this pub car park, Daniel feels strong. He towers over the policeman in a way that makes Polly wonder if they've got rid of the height requirement. She wouldn't be surprised. And she remembers that she actually thought about joining the police after her GCSEs. She thought it would be a good way to ride horses and get paid for it. Daniel is smiling. And it's a wide, welcoming smile, showing all of his teeth. And they're in pretty good nick for his age. They're pretty white, pretty even. Not perfect, obviously, and the smile is actually too big. Just a bit much. It looks desperate. And the policeman is smiling too, but it's a tight, fake smile. And it doesn't reach his eyes, which are small and hard and starey like a bird's. A starling, maybe. Or a seagull. Hello, sir, he says. And he asks if it's Daniel's vehicle, and then he asks if Daniel has had a drink. Yes, it's my car, and of course I've had a drink, says Daniel. We've just come out of the pub. I've had three pints. The policeman says in that case he'd like Daniel to take a breathalyzer test. Daniel huffs and puffs. But I am not the driver. The policeman keeps his cool as he explains that he and his colleague had noticed them leave the pub and get into the red Alfa Romeo Gioletta. He explains that they formed the impression that Daniel had been drinking, and this was because of his unsteady gait. I am 77. I have a dodgy knee. And in any case, let me repeat, I am not the driver. The policeman ignores him and carries on about how he now requires Daniel to take a breath test to determine whether he has a level of alcohol in his blood which would be deemed unlawful under the terms of the Dangerous Driving Act of 1979. Something like that, anyway. Polly doesn't catch the exact details because she's watching Daniel's face. It's gone a scary, purpley red colour. And he moves forward so he's really close to the policeman. He leads down into his face and yells, But I'm not the fucking driver! And little bits of spit zoom out all over the policeman. And it can't be very nice. There's little flecks of Rogue and Josh in there for a start. <laughs> the policeman blinks twice very rapidly. It's the first time he's looked properly human. He steps back and keeps his voice very calm as he explains that Daniel was in charge of the vehicle while he was behind the wheel, and being in charge of a car while intoxicated is, under the terms of whichever act it was, an offence. Even when it's not moving, boss! Polly thinks that Daniel is going to hit him, but he makes a big visible effort, takes a breath, and decides to try and be reasonable. Look, officer. I'll be honest. I was going to drive, but then I noticed you and your colleague and saw sense. Your presence in this car park did the trick. It acted as a deterrent. It prevented a crime being committed. So that's a good thing, isn't it? I saw you and decided that my wife should drive instead. <laughs> wife? Wife? And Polly sees the policeman's eyes widen a little. Wife? Crimes. 
Polly wonders how old this police guy is. It's hard to tell, but he has a smooth, well-moisturised face. Not too many lines and no bags under his eyes. She reckons he's 28 or so, just a bit younger than her. She shakes her head, but she doesn't think he notices. He must know that being Daniel's, her being Daniel's wife is bollocks, though, mustn't he? The police explains all over again that being in charge of a vehicle while being intoxicated is unlawful, even if that vehicle is stationary. Not just fucking stationary, the fucking engine wasn't even turned on. We have just been talking in the fucking car. And Daniel's eyes are red and burning. The copper's eyes just twitch and flicker in that birdie way. And the policeman explains for the third time about the definition of the act, and then there's silence, and again Polly wonders if Daniel is actually going to deck him. And there is a long, long moment where this thing's the most likely thing. Then Daniel gives up. His shoulders sag. He gets about 20 years older in half a second. He takes a step back. He says, well, let's just get this bloody charade over with. And Polly's heart hurts. All the fight has gone out of him, and it's hard. He only got the car today, and now this nasty little twonk is going to take it off him. The policeman unwraps the little cylinder and explains the procedure, and Polly can tell he's working hard at keeping the triumph out of his voice. And Polly thinks how this breathalyzer resembles the latest range of predictors you can get in boots, the new ultra-accurate pregnancy test sticks. And Daniel puts it between his teeth. He grins at Polly and makes like the breathalyzer is a fat cigar. He waggles it and jiggles his eyebrows, which is when she notices that he's trimmed them. They're nowhere near as wild and bushy as they were the other day, and it's another sign of how Daniel wanted to look his best for this trip out in the car. The fact that Daniel is now trying to make a joke of things is making Polly feel physical hurt in her tummy. The policeman tells Daniel to blow into the device properly, and Polly finds herself starting to hate him and his stupid, smooth, plumped up face. She wants to bite it, puncture it somehow, watch it deflate. And now Daniel starts blowing. He blows, and he blows, and he blows. The policeman loses his cool a bit. Please blow properly, sir, he says. I am fucking blowing properly. Oh, don't swear, Daniel, Polly says. It's the first thing she said in the whole incident so far. And Daniel laughs. Sorry, dear, he says. And she laughs too. And they do sound exactly like a husband and wife. The policeman is trying hard not to stare at her. She can tell. More seconds pass. And the policeman takes the device from Daniel and examines it. He, jump, he bites his lip. He explains to them that the device appears to be faulty and that he will have to administer the test again and he, goes, and he will need to return to his vehicle to fetch a new test kit. As he goes and does that, Polly asks why he called her his wife. Daniel doesn't answer, just shrugs. Jump up, little gal lighter, he says. And they stand in silence until the policeman is back with his new test, which he unwraps. And Daniel does his little routine with the kit again, sniffing it, rolling it between his fingers, pretending it's a posh cigar. The policeman sighs. This is all getting too much for him, and Polly can't help it. She giggles. And Daniel laughs, and the policeman sighs and puts on a serious voice as he tells them that being in charge of a vehicle while intoxicated is a very serious offence, and carrying a possible jail sentence, as well as a fine of up to £20,000 or something, and a mandatory 12-month driving ban. Yes, but I wasn't fucking driving, was I, constable? Come on, darling, just do it, Polly says. And she blushes a bit as she feels the policeman's creepy, starling eyes on her. Daniel smiles at Polly, and she smiles back, and then he puts the thing to his lips and blows. He blows. He blows. He blows. The policeman takes it and examines it closely. He puffs out his cheeks. Mmm, he says. So Polly sees it now. She sees that the little light on the test the thing is never ever going to go green or pink or blue or whatever. It's just not going to show Daniel over any limit. She can see it from the way the policeman's face goes a bit wobbly somehow, by the way he presses his lips together, by the way he looks like he's going to cry. Her heart doesn't hurt for him though. Of course, the last person to realise the way things are now is Daniel. And while the policeman pointlessly twists and turns the little machine in his hands, a delighted grin begins to spread very slowly over Daniel's face. It's like the sun coming up. It really is. Oh my goodness, he says. And he starts to dance. 
he actually starts to dance. Slowly, yes, but for real. He lurches in a slow motion dance, almost a spazzy moss, really. He looks like a lunatic drunken great uncle at a wedding. A lunatic great uncle who loves the Foo Fighters or something. Woo-hoo, he goes, and yeah, man! And it's ridiculous, and it's very, very funny, and Polly starts giggling again, and she just can't help it. And then Daniel starts coughing and pulls himself together. Phew, he says. Sorry about that. Guess we don't want to have a heart attack, do we? And he means, not now, thinks Polly, not at the moment of victory. And the policeman doesn't know what to say. He looks at the ground, and Polly wonders what his life is like. Does he have a girlfriend? Kids? Probably not. He doesn't look like he has a baby that keeps him awake. Is he gay, maybe? It's all right for there to be gay policemen these days. And Daniel is still smiling, beaming like a lottery winner. Don't worry, constable, he says. Just doing your job, we know that. Dirty work, but someone's got to do it. There's another long, awkward pause before he says, Well, we can't stand here chatting all day, can we, darling? Places to go, people to see. And Polly doesn't join in the husband and wife game this time. But Daniel doesn't seem to notice as he goes round to the passenger door and opens it. Hop in, dear, he says. And the policeman looks at her. His eyes twitch. Not a starling, she thinks. Not a seagull. A sparrow. A scared hedgerow bird at the mercy of everything. And Polly ducks under Daniel's arm into the car, which she notices still smells of beer. Daniel slams the door shut and walks round to the driver's side. And the sounds of outside are muffled now, so she doesn't hear any words. But she imagines him putting a friendly arm on the policeman's shoulder. She imagines him saying something like, Keep up the good work, or chin up, sonny. Whatever he says, the policeman doesn't say anything back. And he just stands and watches as Daniel drives carefully out of the pub car park. And they don't say anything for a little while. Daniel puts the radio on, classic FM. They're playing a tune that Polly recognises from an old advert. Maybe you should have let me drive back. No, 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 no. Daniel slaps the leather veneer steering wheel. That was the best bit. His face as he realised that I was going to drive after all. Priceless. Absolutely priceless. You were very lucky, Polly says. Yes, says Daniel. I always am. You can judge the quality of a man by how lucky he is. Napoleon said that, you know. And then he explains how it wasn't just luck. How this whole, this is a cigar, comedy, mucking about, and be disguising some, disguising some effective squeezing and shaking and breaking of government equipment. They should invest in the proper stuff, he says. Bloody typical of the British plots to spend hard-earned taxpayers' money on cheap crap. Clever man, thinks Polly. And as they start, stop, start, stop through all the traffic in town, Polly asks Daniel again why he said she was his wife. And Daniel turns to look at her for a long time, and Polly stares straight ahead, and behind them there is an angry toot. And it's funny how you can always tell the difference between an angry, get a bloody move on toot, and a friendly, hi there toot. And they finally start moving. I just wanted to put the little Nazi on the back foot to discombobulate him. You're not offended, are you? And she's not, not really, but she wonders if she should be. You're a bit old for me, Daniel, she says. Age ain't nothing but a number, he says. And then they bump into the car in front. <laughs> Thank you very much. You've been very, very, very